Great test, Elizabeth Short. Don't walk out on me, Richard. Say you care, say it's that you... Short! This is a very sad scene. Do you think you're capable of playing sadness? I can do that. Her name was Elizabeth Short. She was young and beautiful, determined to be famous, but destined to be infamous. Well, right, listen up. No reporters view the body. the true crime. I'm Kristen Lopez, joined by my indomitable co-host, Kimberly Pierce. Kim, how are you? I am excellent. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm excited to talk about our continuation of our true crime summer series, where we are talking about true crime events that happened in Los Angeles in the summertime. If you have not already listened to our first episode in the series, we did one looking at 2003's Wonderland, and talked about the Laurel Canyon four on the floor murders. It was a lot of fun. You should definitely go check that out if you have not already listened to it. And this time we are going all the way back to one of Hollywood's most legendary cases from 1947, The Black Dahlia. But we're going to be looking at it through the lens of two very different films, 1975's Who is the Black Dahlia and 2006's The Black Dahlia. You might think that those titles imply what these movies are about, but you would be wrong. But as as always, if you enjoy what you're listening to, please help us out. Tell your friends who like old Hollywood, who like movies, who like true crime to visit us on our Twitter at ticklish underscore biz. Check us out on YouTube. Visit our official website, journeysinclassicfilm.com or subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash ticklishbiz where they get access to fun shows like this, as well as free movies, free pins, all sorts of stuff. Help us get our listener numbers up by supporting our show. So we are talking about The Black Dahlia this episode, a crime that I feel I can't tell you when I first heard it or about Elizabeth Short. I feel like it's always been there, just always been around. Kim, would you agree? Very much so. This is one, it's always been tied to my old Hollywood kind of consciousness. So there's so many tie-ins with Hollywood, with the industry. And it's one of those, if you're getting in on true crime, you've probably heard of it or deep dived into it at least once. Exactly. It's so representative of everything that we talk about old Hollywood in terms of exploitation of women, in terms of the way that Hollywood chews people up and spits them out in terms of how LA is this hotbed of debauchery and murder and sex and all of these things. And the Black Dolly has been really popular from a filmic standpoint or a narrative standpoint, because there have been numerous movies about her life, or at least as the launch pad for her life. I was actually looking at In researching The Black Dahlia, the 2006 De Palma film, they were talking about other series that tangentially are about The Black Dahlia or other shows. And there are so many shows and movies where it's not really about The Black Dahlia. It's about other things happening and that's just happening in the background. I don't know why this is a case where we don't want to look at it front and center. Do you, I mean, have you noticed that, Kim? I have. I mean, and we've, we'll see this as we dive into this discussion with these two films. I think at some level, it's so representative of this era of Hollywood. It's kind of a way to dive into the Hollywood behind Hollywood, not the one that we see. And it tells you so much about the industry that you don't want to see, that the fixers made sure we didn't see in the papers. I think that's probably why it's a very good storytelling tool, but like we talked about last week that we don't, this is one where we don't know that story. There's still 
so many theories, there's still so many suspects that I could see it being almost hard to narrow down. And so ergo, it turns into a very good storytelling device rather than necessarily a story to explore. Exactly. Kim, do you want to give a brief background on the Dahlia case? So it was January 15th, 1947. A woman was walking down a what was a vacant lot at the time in Los Angeles, and it is now a quaint little suburb, thought what she saw was a drunk laying in the grass in this vacant lot, called the police to report it, turned it out to be the murdered body of who they found out later to be Elizabeth Short. She was incredibly gruesome crime scene. She had been bisected, slashed across the face. Drained of blood. Drained of my blood, yeah. (laughs) Exactly. It's it's one of those crimes that is just utterly insane to really think about it. I've been to Limert Park where Mm -hmm. her body was found. And you're right that it's this really quaint little suburb. It's in an area that is relatively affluent by LA standards. Mm -hmm. And to realize that there was just a body there at some point. She had been dead for around 10 hours prior to the discovery. So they assumed that she died sometime during the evening of January 14th or the early morning of January 15th. And her body had been washed and the draining of blood required a constant stream of running water. That's apparently a thing that you need. And she had been slashed from ear to ear, creating what is known as a Glasgow smile, which is similar to Conrad Veidt's character in The Man Who Laughs, which we include that as a big (laughs) big plot point. She had several cuts on her thigh and her breasts. Entire portions of her body had been sliced away. It's, It's a fairly disgusting crime scene. You can read more. They believe that her body had been posed by whoever left her there. And they didn't know right away who she was. And when they found the autopsy and, and all of that is, is incredibly complex and in-depth in terms of the way that they describe what happened to her. But this was one of those cases where the killer allegedly made some phone calls and had talked about what had happened. They found parts of her body later on in various locations And it's still never been solved. There were numerous suspects and a lot of the movies and television shows that sprung up in the wake of Elizabeth Short's death have tried very hard to either tell you who did it or tell you who Elizabeth Short was. And I don't think either one is necessarily a good way to do it. I don't know if we've hit on one that's worked yet. What I was looking at last night, there's something like 24 suspects still who it could possibly be. And I think what struck me in this most recent look through of it, she was living such a transient life, being a woman in that town, just trying to make it as an extra, you know, a dress extra, a chorus girl. She was never in the same place for long. She was dating men just to get food because it was such a struggle in order to live. So she didn't stay in any one place for long. She didn't have many close friends because that town had used and abused her. So yeah, it's so hard to narrow it down because it was hard to figure out even who this poor girl was. Exactly. And if you look at the suspect list that they have, and we can talk about suspects in a second, it's really just all sorts of people that maybe tangentially were aware of her I think they said like Woody Guthrie is on the list. Yeah. Bugsy Siegel. Orson Wells. Orson I did not Wells know. <laughs> was, was a Dahlia suspect. Um, we could talk about some of the, the bigger ones in a second, because I think there's been a lot of really interesting theories. One book that I feel like everybody should read is Black Dahlia, Red Rose, which is what I read over the pandemic. And it's probably one of the more fascinating and I think logical examination of her death and what happened. And as much as I would love to think some of the more colorful theories are true, I think this one might be the more obvious one. This is a case that I don't doubt will ever be solved at all. It's all but a cold case at this point. So, you know, unfortunately, many of the players are dead. This is a case that will never get a resolution, which I think is the most frustrating point. 
This episode is made possible thanks to the continued support of our lovely Patreon subscribers. If you'd like another way to support us, recommend us to anyone looking for classic entertainment goodness. You can also leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you aren't yet a subscriber, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz for giveaways, early access, and lots more additional bonus content.